we go. My name is Marty Calabrese. I am a naturalist at Cleveland Metro Parks. North Chagrin Nature Center is my home base. And as naturalists, we teach school kids, we teach curious minds, young and grown. I can take uh, guests to the Nature Center on hikes and we can look for wildflowers and mushrooms, do tree identification. And being that it's January right now, we're not going out and catching, surveying insects like dragonflies. So let's talk about it. We need a screen to do that again, because it's January. In fact, looking out of the window right now at a fox squirrel and a tufted titmouse, and it is snowing in Cleveland. It's snowing very hard where I am on the east side of Cleveland in Mayfield Village. Feel free to chime in to the chat box with your viewing location. You can pop in your city and state if you if you so choose. Dragonflies, the dragonflies, and a little bit of damselflies today. So scientists estimate there are 10 million species of animal on Earth. However, 1.3 million, only 1.3 million have been described to science already. So the simplest of these animals are invertebrates. They make up 90% of all living animal species. And this makes sense as 1 million insects have been described. So of those 1.3 million, there are 1 million of those are insects. Animals have evolved in the seas and moved into fresh water and onto land 350 million years ago. But some are still tied to water like today's topic of interest, the dragonfly. So we're gonna talk about dragonflies and damselflies. They're in the insect order of odonata. So sometimes I will say odonates, and I'm referring to dragonflies and damselflies. So odonata, it's a group called order within insects. So it is not beetles. That's a different order. Uh, dra dragonflies and damselflies, again, odonates, are not grasshoppers. So that's a different order. So that's how insects are divided up. There are 5,000 of these species around the world, dragonflies and damselflies, 500 in North America, 81 have been documented in Cleveland Metro Parks, where I am broadcast, broadcasting today, uh, fifth, more dragonflies than damselflies. So at last survey, 50 of the 81 are dragonflies, 31 are damselflies. You'll see the difference momentarily. Clearwater, Florida, no snow there. Well, welcome, Kate. Yeah, it's it's cold here, but not as cold as it is in Michigan, Christina said. 10 degrees with, with six inches of snow on the ground. All right. This is your typical dragonfly. You see a pair of wings and this long abdomen. The wings are connected to the thorax. More on that later. Now forgive me from glancing away from you. I need to see what you're looking at here. And that very large head with big eyes, more on that later. A lot of my photos in this presentation have my hand in it for size perspective, because look at that beast of an insect. All right, now this is getting at Monique's question or her daughter's question, the very next slide right here. On your left, you will see a dragonfly. That's called a widow skimmer. I believe it's a female. She is tearing out of her exoskeleton. Okay, she's tearing out of her nymphal skin. So as a nymph, she's in the water. So take a look at the right. You see this diagram. See those eggs? Those eggs become a nymph. Now, do you see how where the red arrow is pointing? It looks similar to what she, the widow skimmer animal on the left side, is tearing away from. By the way, their exoskeleton in the adult form, the winged form, is made of chitin. This is unbendable. It's very it's secreted by the epidermis. It's very strong, very strong. So as you move through, and what's that process called? It starts with the letter M. As you move through this process, so there's the nymph, and then she or he is tearing away from that nymphal skeleton and, and turning into the winged adult. Butterflies do this, but dragonflies skip the pupil stage where a moth is in a cocoon and a dragonfly is in a, I'm sorry, a butterfly is in the chrysalis. It's metamorphosis. 
And with the dragonflies, it is incomplete metamorphosis. They skip that stage. They skip the sleeping bag, okay? The, the pupil sleeping bag, the cocoon or chrysalis. So here we are with uh, another nymph, another dragonfly nymph on the right in my kid's hand. It's alive, okay? And um, it's in there. That's the animal, all right? It, we grabbed it right out of the water with a net. That's where they live. They breathe air out of the water with lungs at the end of their abdomen. On the left side, you'll see the exoskeleton, the discarded exuvia that's left behind. Do you see those white tubes? See the white strings coming right out of what looks to be the back? Those are tracheal tubes. So those are the air tubes that were embedded into the body of the nymph when it was aquatic. So it can oxygenate. When it becomes this winged adult and it tears away from that exoskeleton, it leaves behind those tracheal tubes. 10 points if you caught the teeny tiny leaf hopper resting on the discarded exuvia there on the near bottom left side of your screen. So there's the nymph, there's the exuviate. Those are the words I've been using, how to spell them. Let's talk about the natural history of dragonflies. We will then identify about a dozen dragonflies and that'll take us our 45 minutes. I'm trying to keep this to a, a a brown bag, a lunch session for us. Dragonfly 101, natural history. Well, they evolved before the dinosaurs. So in the, well, in the Mesozoic era, which is at 250 million years ago, specifically 252 to 266 MYA million years ago. Um, but the, the prototypes show up in the Carboniferous era. So this is the precursor to the real dragonflies. And uh, Carboniferous geologic period, that's at 300 million years ago, 300 to 360 MYA. This example I have here, this plate from the, it's, it's the tan dragonfly fossil that you see there from the Field Museum in Chicago. That's an, that is an extinct genus and dated to the Cretaceous period. So a little younger, that's 145 million years ago to 166 MYA. So what they're carnivorous, they hunt, they hunt mosquitoes. They do this in the air with amazing precision. More on that later. They're just amazing hunters. And they do this around wetlands. They are tied to wetlands. Their life is tied to water, fresh water. Taxonomy. So how are they divided within the group of living things called animals? Well, they're in the kingdom of animalia. They're in the phylum of arthropoda. What's an arthropod? Well, arthropods are, first of all, first of all, 84% of all known animal species fall in that phylum of arthropoda. Uh, they are invertebrates. So no backbones, no vertebrate. They are animals that have an exoskeleton. So that unbendable chitin outer surface, segmented bodies, and paired jointed appendages. So a pair of arms with joints, but I don't have an exoskeleton. I have an internal skeleton, an endoskeleton, if you will. They are in the class of insects within animals and underneath the class of insects, they're in the order of Odonata. Again, not beetles, not grasshoppers. So that sort of sorts it in your head where they are as insects. In this order of Odonata, you're looking on the screen here, that bluish animal, that's a damselfly. See how the eyes are separated? And that's in the middle a female damselfly. She is not as colorful. See her beauty dots? And on your right with the white tail, that's a common white-tailed dragonfly. See how that dragonfly has its wings out while it's landed and at rest. Whereas the damselfly has them folded back like a butterfly. Okay, now the damselfly, uh, as I'm pointing out here, the ebony jewel wing, the ebony jewel wing, bluish, greenish if you're the male, black if you're the female. There's a study published in the 2020 
that looked at the color of dragonflies and damselflies through UV filters. Looking at the screen here of the one of the figures from the study on your right side, top of the page, look at the first row, A, B, C, D, of animals, these dragonflies and damselflies, and then look at the second row of images just beneath it. That's what they look like through a UV filter. So that's interesting. It shows you that these animals are communicating perhaps uh, with species, with uh, other individuals of their same species and with individuals of other species. So this happens with dragonflies. This happens with damselflies. The iridescent wings are found mainly in damselflies though. So damselflies fly a little bit slower. So I hypothesize perhaps it's just, um, it's evolved that way because they're, they're easier to see if they're flying more slowly. I noticed that lots of the dragonflies have clear wings. But anyways, moving forward, where do you find these? So some dragonfly habitats. Uh, this particular image here has the building in which I sit at this very moment. Completely different season. Uh, I'm in January right now, snow outside of the window, and I'm in the building way in the back called North Sugar and Nature Center in North Sugar and Reservation, Cleveland Metro Parks on the east side of Cleveland. You see, this is a perfect dragonfly habitat as they need to complete their metamorphosis. They emerge from that water. They grab hold of some vegetation there. And they tear out of that nymphal skeleton and they fly off and they just catch the next insect that's doing the very same thing. It's a great setup, but you can also find them in less sunny conditions where there's moving water. So that other image was a marsh or very pond-like scenario. Right here, we have a stream or a river, it's moving and, and parts of it are shady. So you get a whole different variety of species. Hinkley Lake here at Cleveland Metro Parks. Sunny, big lake. And yes, there's dragonflies inside of that water right now. And they'll spend years in the water, perhaps three, four, five, six years before they emerge to live perhaps one year as the winged adult. Also dragonfly habitat is a field, a meadow. There's water nearby, but this particular field can certainly provide some big cruising dragonflies, wandering glider, for example. And I'll show you a photograph of that animal. Also these smaller, maybe not so temporary ponds, but just these smaller ponds that are hidden, maybe a retention pond because there's a parking lot that was put in and then you have a lower area that's scooped out to catch all the water. And this one has vegetation around it. So you better believe there's dragonflies in there. Dragonfly importance. Well, they're eating food, teeny tiny microscopic food when they are in their nymph stage. They're eating it and then they emerge from the water. Perhaps they will then be eaten by a bird, which doesn't live in the water. It lives on land, lives in the trees, it's air, you know. So it is getting energy from a different habitat. The dragonfly takes energy across a border. It's fascinating. Also, they are biological indicators. So they can tell you if you catch enough, if the water quality is good or fair or poor and with catching enough individual aquatic insects you can do a cumulative index and it outputs you with a nice score a pretty meaningful score to assess water quality and this is in the absence of using chemistry to test the water we call it bio what we call biomonitoring when you use bioindicators to do that and of course recreation they're fun to watch Difficult to photograph, but so worth it with the right equipment. They can be fun to catch if you do so safely during a survey. I, kids help me catch these dragonflies all the time. And you can catch them and then you can start to record what you find. I'm more on that later with some community science, some ongoing community science projects. Dragonfly morphology. Morphology just sort of means the, how the body looks and it's different pieces and parts. Can you find the dragonfly? Do you see it? Among the other insects, there is a dragonfly on the screen, right in the center. You see it now. I've circled its head. It's 
an insect. So how many body parts does it have? How many big body parts? I'm referring to a term called tagmata. And although it's a little jargony, thorax. So a total of three body parts. If you say head, thorax, you probably know that I'm going to say next, abdomen. So head, thorax, abdomen. The thorax, the green circle in the center, very meaningful part of the body. It has its wings connected to it, which can be driven by individual muscles in all sorts of directions, independent of each other. And its legs are connected to the thorax. Let's look at these incredible eyes. Incredible eyes. They're compound eyes. You've heard this term, compound eyes. It's made up of thousands of lenses, these facets. 80% of their brain is dedicated to eyesight. And they, this provides them with a, all those lenses, a 360 degree field of view. They can see in front of them, they can see behind them. They can do this with 200 little teeny pictures a second. That's way better than us humans. Our eyes shoot at 30 to 60 frames per second. So the dragonfly is at 200 images per second. So well, very superior to humans. And it makes sense. Look at the size of these eyes. I mean, they're, they're a very impressive part of the body. Taking a closer look now, the, the dragonflies, and actually, and bees, have the largest compound eyes of all the insects, each containing up to 30,000 of these facets called omatidia. And each facet points in a different direction, and it creates its own image. And that's what is compiled into one photo. More on the face. I've circled these uh, antennae neighboring the center of the face there, okay? And they can sense uh, wind speed and direction, so it's just one added feature on the body to make the dragonfly the ultimate predator. Okay, let's take a look here at a video. I might be choppy for you, but let's work through it here. Can you identify the body parts of this dragonfly? Find the head, it's up on top. Find the thorax, it's green. It's where the wings are connected to. I'm holding the wings of this recently emerged common green darner. Find the abdomen, it looks sort of purplish blue on my screen and it's uh, above my finger. Do you see all six legs, three pairs of legs? So again, it's an insect, head, thorax, abdomen, six legs. The, the wings look pretty waxy there because well, mine glitched, so I'll move forward. Because it's a young individual, you'd say it's a tenoral individual. It recently emerged. So I put it back on this American beach and so we can dry out. This is what we were looking at, the common green darner. So now we'll cover about a dozen of these dragonflies. And if you have any other questions, you can continue to put them in the chat as I will not be able to hear you. And I can address those right after we look at some of these insects. And if you have any other questions at this point, you can do that right now as I'm peeking over to see, to make sure that we have our guests. And I was expecting about 30 today from uh, across the United States. I was excited to see this showing of interest in dragonflies. Okay, common green darner, one of the biggest, fastest of all the flying insects. And what I'll do each time we visit a new species, I'll have my hand, generally I'll have my hand in the photo to give you a quick sense of size perspective. I will tell you how many inches it is from the front to the end of its body. So up in front of the eyes to the end of the abdomen, when I say how many inches it is. So it, it, an example, this common green donor is 3.25 inches. So it's, three and a quarter inches. Now, when I tell you this for each species, there's a little bit of a range sometimes with males and females, one bigger or smaller, and there's a range among individuals, but I picked what I feel is a good average. I'll also tell you with each individual species that I introduce when it flies. So the common green darner flies from mid-April to October. 
The outer tails of that window are constantly being pushed by greater sampling effort and more people enthusiastic about catching and photographing or photographing and not catching dragonflies. I'll also tell you where you might come across this individual and you don't have to try and catch them to come across it. You'll see them fly by and perhaps land on something and you find the common green darner at ponds, lakes, and wetlands. This is the first of three migratory individuals. Oh yes, I just said it migrates. The common green darner leaves Ohio and it flies down to Mexico and then it comes back. So some of these insects, these dragonflies, do die within the first year of their adult winged life, but not the common green darner, although it spends years of its life in water as the nymph. Okay, moving forward. So that is, we've met the widow skimmer at first, but this is our first official species here. Okay, next up, the common white tail. And oh yes, it is common, it's very common. You could see them, they'll often have landed. That's when you'll notice it. And look at that white tail and the individual on the right. Some of them vary. Some of the species vary from if the male looks different than the female. You call that sexual dimorphism. Uh, sometimes on the screen, though, on, today, I'll be sharing this individual on the left may be a recently emerged individual. So it may not fully look like the adult. Its, it's uh, wings look wet. Again, I refer to that as tenoral. So the common whitetail flies from May to September, and this is at ponds, streams, actually almost any wet area, and it is 1.75 inches long. The wings are splashed with a, a bit of black. Do you notice that on the individual on the right? The female does lack a white tail. So just like songbirds, Many of these individuals look different from male to female. The Eastern Pond Hawk, it flies May to October at wetlands, lakes, and ponds. It is 1.75 inches, so similar to the common whitetail, but not, it's a little more elongate, don't you think? It's a little more slender, it sounds chunky. The female, those are the individuals to the left they are, with the green abdomen, stripes with black. The male is that, oh, that powdery blue on the right. Isn't that pretty? And these two, they look like completely different species, don't they? But their sexual dimorphism is just that strong. They look that different. And it often rests on the ground. So this is one of those that you can stumble across accidentally. Eastern Pond Hawk. Thank you for the comment there, Christina. This lady skimmer, it flies May to September. I consider this to be a special find when I when I see one, photograph one, catch one. At times I've have read and it is considered somewhat uncommon. However, when you find one, it's very locally common. So if you see one, you're going to see a ton. But you could go one county over in Ohio or just one lake over and you will not see any. I don't know that. I don't know why. So it's, it's gray blue. And that's unlike any other local species. Uncommon enough, yeah, that I get excited. Uh, two inches in length. Ponds and lakes. Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, that, that coloration right there is unlike any other that I stumble across. The Swamp Darner, this beast of a dragonfly is really a big one in Ohio. Over three and a half inches. So 3.5 to 3.75 inches. Swamp Darner, huge. Now, there's a, there's a couple other big dragonflies. One of them is called the Dragon Hunter, and uh, that's 3.33 inches, three and a quarter. And uh, Dragon Hunter might have a cooler name, but the, you're more likely to come across a Swamp Darner. Uh, the smallest dragonfly in Ohio, by the way, is called the Elfin Skimmer. It has less than an inch. It is 0 0.85 inches. Documented, among other places, uh, first in Summit County, by Cleveland Museum of Natural History. I believe it's one of their natural areas, probably Singer Lake Bog. 
Don't quote me on it, although I know I'm being recorded. Okay. The swamp darner flies late April to August, and it is seen near wooded wetlands. So what I mean is you can be in the forest, an area of woods that neighbors a wetland or a stream, and you could come across this individual, and you might not even be near that body of water. Beautiful animal. Look at the size of that in my hand. 12, nope, not yet. The black, the black saddle bags, okay. The saddle bag, the black saddle bags. Flies May to October. And this is at ponds and fields. And two inches long. Well, it feels like a big individual. Two inches long. It has the yellow spot on the abdomen. Ooh, could you see that on your screen? Not so much. And it's uh, it's black purple. It does have the, now here's what's really notable and a good field trait. It has the splotch of black with bits of purple near the body. That is the telltale sign. See that there? It's the second of our three migratory individuals that I'm mentioning today. First was the common green darner. This puppy flies down to Mexico as well, like the common green darner, but it's a little less common. Black saddlebag. Now the 12-spotted skimmer. If you take a look at the, the wings here, each wing has three black spots. Between the black spots is a spot of white. Now that's each wing. So get your eyes focused on that. I tried to photograph this from different angles because you can see that color pattern from all the angles. Now it flies May to September. This is at ponds, streams, and wetlands, two inches long. And the female abdomen, I do want to mention, lacks the white. Uh, but she does have these two white lines trailing the abdomen on the sides. But otherwise, uh, sometimes the female 12-spotted skimmer and a female common whitetail can give people, myself, trouble with identification. Eastern amber wing, a teeny one and only an inch, but still not as small as that smallest in Ohio, the elf and skimmer. Eastern amber wing flies late May to September, and this is at pond and stream edges. And really, they do like to hang out at the edge. I, I also see them at lake edges, like Hink Hinkley Lake in Ohio, right at the edge. So, uh, we have a male and female here. On the left is the male with the amber wings. The female clear wings with brown spots. Quite different, wouldn't you say? But similar behavior, hanging out near that edge. And they, not, not just where, but just sort of the way they behave is similar. So it's, it's not so hard that when you see this female eastern amber wing to know it's one because you'll see a male of one second later. Oh, thank you for the kind words, folks. Some of them are coming in to just me, and it's okay if you want to share any questions to, to the group under the everyone drop-down. But thank you, everybody. The Blue Dasher. Just a few more dragonflies for you here. The Blue Dasher. We have here the male, uh, which is blue, on the left. And of the three photos, photo middle and photo right, are likely female because they have the, the striped black the thorax, the center body part. So left is the head, middle is the thorax, and off to the right, if you're looking at the center photo, is the abdomen. This individual species flies May to September. It's at ponds and wetlands. I consider it common. And um, an inch and a half, it's an inch and a half, so it's medium size. Do you notice anything about the photo all the way to the right? Look at it, examine it, look at the head, look at the thorax, look at all the way down to the tip of the abdomen. Is something squirting out there? I do believe those are eggs. So that must be a female. And I do think she is, was perhaps ready to squeeze out some eggs. So I'm sure we put her back. This was during a survey. I had mentioned kids help me with the surveys. It's true. They help me catch these dragonflies because the, the kids can keep running. I might be faster, 
but they can keep running. Okay, the wandering glider. Now, this individual species is faster than, I mean, Usain Bolt. This is a, this is a quick one. And they keep flying, although actually the common green darner, I think, is our fastest flyer. All right, it flies late May to mid-October, the wandering glider, at ponds, temporary pools, lakes, parking lots, and fields. The field habitat I showed you before is definitely prime habitat for, uh, to come across this wandering glider. Almost two inches long, and if you have a net and you're trying to catch a wandering glider, good luck. It takes a team. You've got to triangulate the individual. You, you got to sort of plan its trajectory and cut it off at the turn. And, and it can see all over the place. Remember, it can see in 360 degrees and it can see faster than you. It's seeing more images per second. Remember, 200 images, frames per second, whereas we're just seeing 30 to 60. So, I mean, you know, good luck. This thing is farther, farther along than us when it comes to evading predators and catching prey. So clear wings, but it's our only yellow-bodied local dragonfly. I didn't show you any other that quite had this yellow. I showed you the amber wings, but this is yellow with designs of black on it. And it's our third of the three migratory individuals I showed you. Individual number one was the common green darner, species number one. Species number two, the black saddlebags. Now both of those are USA down to Mexico. This is a dragonfly of worldwide distribution. I think wherever you're viewing from today, we have uh, Kansas, Michigan, uh, perhaps Alaska tuned in, I'm not sure. But this is a worldwide distribution. And when it migrates from Ohio, okay, so it's going from up in Canada through Ohio during our summers down to Florida and South America this time of year. So today is January with snow outside. So it's still alive as an adult down in Florida and perhaps South America. Beautiful individual, again, tricky to catch. As I've been showing you these species and we're up to our last individual in a moment, we've been moving through the year. I didn't divide these scientifically by taxon, by taxonomy, by family. I, I, I input the photos based on when I caught them throughout one summer. So it was a natural progression of when you might stumble across these individuals. The autumn meadowhawk makes sense. In fall, this, this individual lasts, well, let's say, I mean, it does start flying in July, but it lasts into November. And I grabbed this photo on the left in November one year, and other naturalists have documented this individual past November. It's unbelievable. You'll find them in ponds and lakes, surrounding the ponds, marshes and lakes. 1.25 inches for this meadowhawk, the autumn meadowhawk, formerly called the yellow-legged meadowhawk. So I do want to point out that, and oh, it's tricky to tell, even if you've caught it. You're looking at the individuals here on the screen. Pick one. Look at its legs. I'm telling you, they're not black. I'm not saying they're yellow, but they are not black. So the yellow-legged meadowhawk, the former name, is helpful when referring to the common meadowhawk. Now, meadowhawks, this genus, is recently proven very difficult to identify um, for naturalists and biologists and, and citizen scientists. Okay, so its face and eyes are red, um, and again, with those yellow legs, and it's a late flyer. All right, let's move on to some, uh, we'll wrap it up here, and let's just move on to some of the ways that people, everyday folks, have been able to contribute to what has become quite a robust, uh, robust data set of the, the range, so the distribution of where to find different species and when you will find those different species, the, the, the flight range, the window of flights. All right, so community science opportunities. This is the, uh, a project on iNaturalist called Dragonflies and Damselflies of the New World. So uh, it's, it's a, of a more global distribution, this project, but technically the Western Hemisphere, the Americas. 
We do have a local one in Ohio. It's the Ohio Odonata Survey or Ohio Dragonfly Survey on iNaturalist. And you can join these projects. Even if you don't contribute to them, you'll get the journal updates. And I just got one the other day. This particular project, in two, the 2021 results are in. It, it turned in 26,232 observations, 140 species, which is almost a record year for this survey, this project, and uh, over 1,000 individuals contributed. So now how did most of them do that? With their cell phone. It's one of these animals that if you are with the right people and you've caught it safely, it's generally a cell phone that's gonna get you a quality photo up close if you're taking the correct photos. So this is a great project that I recommend. And I see one or two questions came in. Let me, let me grab that question. Do the migrating dragonflies lay eggs all along their path and then in Florida as well? Or do the nymphs need the colder climate? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we're talking about more than one species here, common green darner, black saddlebags, and wandering glider. I do not know for sure. I'm leaning towards that they do not, that, that they're it's almost like birds. They migrate north for their breeding season and then they winter south. I'd like to look into that. And uh, I should hope that you and I will be able to connect somehow because I am quite curious. And if, if you can, uh, I'm gonna type my email address into here and anybody is welcome to email me their follow-up questions because just like you i want to know the answers okay moving forward we're just about finished here i do want to mention that cleveland metro parks we do have our own checklists many many plant and animal checklists that have been created for you know, trees and wildflowers and we do have one for dragonflies and damselflies. And you can go to clevelandmetroparks.com and use the search bar, type in checklists or plant and animal checklists. And then you'll see the whole menu and you'll see one for dragonflies. This is just a screenshot of one of them. Now I am gonna paste something right into the comments. And what I just pasted in there is a link to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife PDF of its free field guide. This field guide is handy because it's respective to Ohio. So it's just going to have your damselflies and dragonflies. Here we go. Division of Wildlife, Ohio's Department of Natural Resources. It just has species in Ohio. So that's pretty helpful when for all of us when you're learning anything new or continuing to get better at what you've already what you've already learned and you're building on that knowledge it, it can help you to narrow it down and that just about does it thank you so much for sharing your time with me on dragonflies and damselflies i do want to say a few things this program is and has been recorded it will show up on the cleveland metro parks lifelong learners page you will receive an email if you registered for this program that has a link to that page the page will then house a, the youtube video of this recording which will show up on cleveland metro parks youtube our next virtual program for the public is uh, owl investigators and naturalist beth joave also of this nature center north chagrin nature center is going to deliver that on February 15th at 11.30 a.m. That's also a weekday. It's a Tuesday. Register at clevelandmetroparks.com when you see it on the calendar. You just go right to the homepage, scroll down to the calendar, navigate over to February 15th. Any final questions before I say goodbye? You've, you've been a, a, a wonderful audience, and I've enjoyed spending the middle of my Friday with you learning about dragonflies together. When they start to fly uh, this, this spring and this summer, if you, even if you don't know what species you're looking at, or the advice I wanna share with you, please, when you see those individuals, 
start to notice that they're different. The one you just saw is different than the next one. And when you notice that, notice that its behavior is different. Is it flying in circles? Is it flying in long lines? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it flying high or low? Did it land? Is it near a water's edge? What type of water is it near? Pond, lake. Okay, folks. Bye-bye. Take care. We're cutting the feed so long. See you soon. I'm Marty Calabrese. Bye-bye.